Hello, everyone, and welcome to What's Stopping You? Fostering Female Ambition. My name is Clyde Bellingham, and I am the Deputy President of the Institute of Chartered Accounts of Scotland. And I'm fortunate to be your host today. In this webinar, we will reveal results of a, of a research study into our profession conducted by Magenta on behalf of Chartered Accountants Worldwide Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Task Force made up of the member institute representatives. You'll be able to download the study summary report via the QR code on the screen or by heading over to the Chartered Accountants Worldwide website. Globally, Magenta surveyed 3,000 female and male participants and conducted over 60 hours of interviews so we could build a global picture to understand and map the career journeys of women and discover the challenges and opportunities they face. In the next hour, we will delve into the findings and offer some actionable solutions to address some of the issues that have come to light. It's amazing to see how many people have joined us. We have over 1,200 attendees from 57 countries today, which is truly exceptional. And I must say that as a partner with PwC for 27 years, I personally have experienced the benefit of inclusive leadership. I believe that a diverse and inclusive team offers the best position to work and the greatest value in the marketplace. Now, before we hear from the speakers, we have some housekeeping notes to run through. Uh, firstly, there will be polls asked and the option to post questions in Slido on this page. Please engage with us. It makes the experience better for everyone. And we encourage you to share your favorite quotes or moments from this event on social media and tag us in your posts. So I was, I was expecting a slide with social media handles to pop up, but that, doesn't, that hasn't happened. Okay, there. Um, our first speaker today is Dr. Sarah Jenkins, a director at Magenta, who carried out the global study. Sarah, over to you. Thank you very much for having me along today. Um, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to work on this amazing project as well and to the profession for being willing to kind of take a good look at what's going on and what you can do uh, to support women moving from mid-career level into those senior positions. So what I'm going to share to with you today is a real highlight. Uh, there's more available in the full report. I've only got 10 minutes so I will fly through quite quickly um, and just bear with me. So just to give you a bit of a flavour as to what we did, we um, worked in seven markets. We spent 60 hours talking to mid-career level women, senior women, mid-career level men, and we did a global survey. So the results of which I'm gonna share some of those, just the tip of the iceberg with you today. But I think it's fair to say, uh, starting from the top then, that throughout their career, women are significantly more likely to experience barriers to their career progression. If we look at this top 10 here, those we can see that management style of their line manager and company culture are really key factors that come in. Um, but there's also a belief that they have unequal access to opportunities. And by this, we're referring to those opportunities that they're given through their career progression as they grow and they learn. Those access to projects, working with different clients, working with things outside their comfort zone, learning different skills, they're not necessarily feeling like they're giving the same access to those opportunities as their male counterparts. In addition, there is a feeling of acceptance when it comes to kind of the behaviour and the culture that goes on um, amongst their kind of male colleagues. So as a woman, you have to put up with more stuff and be more tolerant than your male counterparts. So it's a combination of these multiples of factors, management style, company culture, behaviour of colleagues that combined really knocks the confidence out of women to progress into senior positions. So we can see there they have the sort of a lack of confidence in their ability. Interestingly, conversely, by the time men reach their late career, they're significantly more likely to claim that they have not experienced any barriers in their career. So quite a different story when it comes to male uh, counterparts. 
all the women that we spoke to were able to recount experiences when they felt they were treated differently due to their gender. They all had experiences of microaggressions and whilst that, that happened whilst they were trying to establish their career and move through their career. They got frustrated, they got angry, but their lack of confidence, uh, they had a lack of confidence in being able to call those out in the moment and be confrontational um, because the kind of silent bystanders reinforcing the acceptance. If nobody says anything in the room around you, then it really, you know, it's kind of an accepted behaviour that somebody talks to you in that way or says that. Um, and there's often nowhere to go for impartial advice or support when it when difficult situations arise. So instead of being confrontational um, or getting hauled into difficult procedures, they prefer to sort of move into a new role or try and ignore those indiscretions and turn that motivation into motivation um, and we know that 8 in 10 mid-career women believe they still have a lot to offer the profession but that women feel like they need to work twice as hard as their male counterparts. Being a woman and being a parent is where most of the barriers lie. But yet, regardless, their, and regardless of their employment, women um, are still expected, even if they're earning more than their partner or even if they're working hard, what have you, women are still expected to be the primary carer for their children. They're the ones that are expected to juggle family life and their career. Um, yet uh, we know that they, their career is still, still really valued to them and they want it to be a valued part of their life and moving forward. They may still be trying to juggle multiple responsibilities at work and at home. They may need a bit of flexibility to enable them to do that, but they're no less ambitious. Seven in 10 women with children under 10 years believe that they can obtain a senior position. Um, so despite all that's going on at home and despite being a parent, there's still a desire for them to kind of really be valued and move forward with their progression. But we know that supportive line managers can have a really big impact. They can help to broaden the experiences that women have. They can help to manage the work-life culture. We know that company culture is really set by the senior leadership. So there may be equality policies that are in place, but are, what are the lived experiences are of those policies? They're often shaped by the attitudes and behaviours of those in more senior positions, which consequently influences the behaviour of other people below them. So if the one, if the people at the senior level are not behaving in a way that is felt to be supportive, setting good practice, setting good examples, then that doesn't filter through. But a supportive line manager can really help to help be, get through all of that and manage that. So managers who talk, listen and support women are really highly valued and often shape the type of leader that that woman then moves in to become. They either want to be like that person or if they've had a bad experience, definitely not be like that person and be something else. So. One lady here sort of spoke to us about he would, you know, her good experience with a line manager. He would bring me into meetings, get me involved. He'd pick out training courses that were relevant and encourage me to go on them. When he left the company, he suggested I moved into management and replaced them. So really, it's about kind of setting that culture and understanding, you know, what does it mean on a daily basis? Having that relationship with your staff and your colleagues really can help make a difference. The other thing that we've learned as well is that the chartered accountancy profession really offers a lot more opportunity than women realize when they're in their kind of more junior levels by the time they hit their mid and late career they kind of understand that they can move into other areas of the industry other levels of the profession that really could accommodate what they need or suit what they're looking for at that period of time after the birth of my daughter, I moved into an industry role. I had a great boss who was really open. I was able to negotiate good terms for my role, including great flexibility. So knowing that those opportunities are available are re is really important um, in sort of helping and encouraging the career level, level women find the right route through to their senior level. The other thing that we kind of wanted to highlight that can really make a big difference is in relation to networking. Networking currently is done often in environments at times in locations that really don't suit women or necessarily that all women would feel comfortable. So it can take place in venues where women aren't necessarily able to participate. Um, we've got the kind of golf course here, but we had kind of late night drinking venues or, you know, it, it often involves alcohol. It can often involve late nights. It can often involve 
multiple late, late nights in a week. So whilst they may be able to get childcare cover maybe for one night or two nights, perhaps not every night, but in addition, it's worth remembering that parents want to spend time with their children. They don't want to be out networking every single night. So really, I suppose what we're challenging is whether or not networking needs to take place in these environments. And actually, it can be done differently. So just one example here, and we've got lots of others in the report, but one example from a lady we spoke to who's part of the Maori culture, where it's absolutely expected that it's family inclusive. You take your children along with you. It's a family event. And you ask about how your family's doing. You ask about how you're doing. It might lead to a business conversation or it might not. You're catching up with people. If you leave an impression on someone, they will contact you later. So actually work is done differently. Um, you know, the kind of networking can be done differently uh, if you think about it. So we really wanted to kind of end on some of the tangible actions that you perhaps as an employer, as a colleague can do in order to support mid-career level women in moving into those senior positions. So think about supporting women as they learn. Think about diversity in your recruitment and making sure that there is diversity amongst your kind of entry level junior teams. Allow flexibility for study time during the working day. Women have a lot of responsibilities outside of work. It is not always possible for them to do that studying or the amount of studying that's needed. So consider allowing some of that to happen during the day. Ensure equal opportunities are available for all. Ensure that people have access to working with different clients, different experiences, different locations, working with different teams so that they can all grow. At the moment, women are not feeling like they are getting the same experiences as their male counterparts. Foster a culture of support, looking out for each other, supporting each other, you know, and making sure that everybody's kind of getting those opportunities. Facilitate an inclusive culture, embed good practice as standard practice. We don't want case studies flagshipping what's being done with one person. We want it to be the norm. Think about how you can facilitate wider opportunities for people to experience different roles. Work out what's right for them. Establish a discrimination education program for all. You do not need to take women into a room and talk to them about what it's like to be a woman or how to deal with discrimination. You need to talk to everybody about what discrimination looks like, what is considered discrimination. Some people don't necessarily think that the way things are is discriminatory to certain groups. So it's for everybody. Nurture confidence and self-promotion. Encourage people to put themselves forward, to stand up, to self-promote. People need that kind of nurturing when they've been knocked down or they've got a lot going on. Support your, your kind of colleagues as they're going through it. Support working parents and their needs. If people have had time outside of work and they're coming back into work, there's a huge nervousness about being able to kind of run as fast as they did the first day that they get back into work. Set up networks of working parents, get a buddy system in place where you can, you know, you're both working parents coming back at the same time, be there for each other or someone's been through it a month before, give some tips and tricks. What to wear on your first day? Does Microsoft Office still work? What's my login? These are things which are just really practical and basic that you can really help uh, with encouraging women and getting them back into work in a way that doesn't knock their confidence immediately. Think about networking events as we've already spoken to and champion those senior leaders who share parenting responsibility. Let them be seen to be leaving the, uh, leaving work at five o'clock, um, etc. And finally, facilitate training and development. Think about other opportunities that mid-career level women might want to move into to help uh, manage that time in their career. So self-employment opportunities, enable coaching and mentoring, develop some industry ambassadors, think about subsidizing training costs. It can be a high, highly um, costly time having children, moving back to work, there's one incumbent in the household. They can't always get the training that they need. Think about facilitating some job swap and shadow opportunities so that people can see other areas of the business and work out where's right for them. And I'm gonna finish there. Uh, hopefully that gave you some, some things to think about. Thank you, Sarah, for your fascinating insights. And I really won't be long enough to unpick everything that you uncovered in the findings. However, this will be an ongoing conversation. So before we move to our next speaker, I'd like to ask the audience a poll question. The poll question is, what is the biggest barrier to your career progression? And the choices are glass ceiling, 
gender discrimination, pay disparity, being a parent. So just wait a few moments for that to conclude. Uh, I'll just wait uh, a few seconds more while everybody completes it. Interestingly, fluctuating a little bit, the two points which are clearly ahead ahead are glass ceiling and being a parent almost equal barriers at around 35 percent of the audience that's interesting fascinating um now we're going to move on we've got uh, a lot to cover in 60 minutes so i do apologize for hustling us along um next up we have Ainsley Van Oslen, CEO of Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand, or CANS to many of us. Ainsley, what sort of challenges have you faced along your career path? And do the poll results surprise you? Thanks, Clive. No, not really. I think it's a, a little bit of everything in that poll, but I think the fact that it said glass ceiling and parent being the number one and number two is, is probably spot on, I'd say. Um, first, I'd probably like to start reflecting on those top barriers that Sarah discussed in her presentation, in, in particular the gaps between men and women on those issues perceived as being a barrier to a person's career. There was such a huge divide in the area of childcare. So 25% of women said that taking time off to work to care for their children was a barrier for their career, compared to 3% of men. As well as being a parent or guardian, 9% of men compared to 25% of women. And that divide, I think, quite simply comes down to different lived experiences. There are many women who still live in situations where they are expected to be the primary caregiver. And if you've ever done an unconscious bias um, a session with Harvard, um, so they're free on the internet. If you do the domesticity one, you'll see why that is. Uh, men and women, we often think that the primary caregiver should be a woman. And that happens with either at home or within all of the communities that we, we live in. in. In Australia, for example, where I hail from, um, including those that hold down full-time jobs, women are still doing more in the home than men. We had a recent survey from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, and it showed that 62% of women spend five or more hours a week on unpaid housework compared to 35% of men. And often it would be more than five hours, I'd say. Um, now, I've been really fortunate in my own personal life that in my family, parenting and domestic duties are shared equally, and they have been since the get-go, since we had our two daughters. So my husband and I both really benefited from an arrangement where we've both been carers of our two, two girls, now 14 and 16. Um, but when they were really young, uh, my husband, Peter, he mushed as many carrots and changed as many nappies as I did. Um, and you know, to this day, our daughters, who are now teenagers, um, you might even hear them in the background tonight if they're, if they're, if they're yelling, um, they share a very, very close and special bond with their dad. Um, and, and this is why I wrote an article recently for The Australian, which is our big masthead here over in Australia. And I talked about our own data at Cairns, uh, where we found that just 18% of men surveyed had taken a career break for parental leave. And that was in contrast to 76% of women. So they're pretty stark statistics. And the there's often a phrase that we use when we talk about um, gender equality or inter on International Women's Day, which is you can't be what you can't see. And it's often explained to use, it's often explained to, to, as to why we see less women taking on careers traditionally dominated by men. But I think it could also be used to describe men and their relationship with parental leave. Uh, in particular, men who are in their early stages of their careers, they don't, if they don't see male leaders and colleagues taking a career break to care for their children, then how can they ever feel comfortable doing it themselves, taking that you know, early walk to the lift as you've got to pick up kids, for example? 
So it's it's not just about relieving from women the burden of sole parenting so they can be more empowered to participate in the workforce. I think there's also a societal advantage as well, ultimately not only just fixing the pay gap, but also the relationship that men can have with their children. Um, And if they choose to take up parental leave or work more flexibly um, in a family-friendly way, I truly believe that men have a more stronger relationship in their family life and that's something I feel very very strongly about men experiencing that rich and rewarding benefits of hand-on parenting and I really don't think it can be underestimated um, in terms of empowering more women to progress through their career as well. I might just move sort of on a slightly personal sort of front so in terms of the challenges that I've faced um, I can relate to the survey's findings on confidence being an issue for women which is why I believe mentoring is really important particularly for young women. What mentoring does is it kind of gives you the confidence to move forward knowing that someone else has been there before you and that they back you. Uh, When I was a young partner at a law firm in my um, very early 20s, um, I needed that confidence boost when I had a very large trial matter um, that was coming to a head and I was about to go on parental leave. And I asked my partners in that law firm, I was the only female partner, uh, whether I could go on parental leave or when I could go on parental leave, I'd like to be able to work part-time because I was really living and breathing this case, which was about to go to a jury trial. Now, it was at that point where I really faced a brick wall of inflexibility. Um, I heard comments to the effect of, look, we've tried that before with other women in the office and it just didn't work. Uh, So I was given two options, the option of coming back to work full time for six months uh, or um, that the case would be taken away from me if I wanted to have my full 12 months of parental leave. And I contemplated that situation for a long time. I spoke with my husband about it as well about which option I would choose. And and then I stopped and I questioned, well, why did I think there was only two options here? Um, And that's when I contemplated setting up my own practice. And I spoke to a range of people, a range of mentors, um, people who set up their own businesses. And I realized it wasn't uh, an insurmountable challenge. I just needed to break it down step by step and then have the confidence to sort sort of step off that cliff, so to speak, of setting up my own business. And I still remember that day when I came back to um, my all-male partners and said, look, thanks so much for those two options, but I found a third better option, um, and that's setting up my own shop. And I had a soft landing. A lot of my clients came with me, uh, not just that one, and not only was I more profitable um, working on my own than with my fellow partners, but I got to spend time with my um, gorgeous young family, and I got to do it on my own terms and with flexibility. So in one respect, I have been very fortunate to be in a situation where my career progression has not been hampered by the stereotypes within my own home, but I have felt stereotypes outside of the home. But I've been able to push past those challenges with the help of mentors who've helped me instill in me a sense of self-belief, as well as, um, of course, it's always good to have a lot of ambition, a lot of hard work, and a bit of luck doesn't go astray either. Thanks, Clive. Thanks very much, Hensley. That was... uh fascinating experience and uh, I wish we had more time to share more of it but uh, sticking to the timetable as we, we currently are thank you again um Joe joins us now Joe has been involved in EDNI in your former role at Cannes but now you focus on championing women what brought you to this point and what insights can you share with us Joe Well, thanks very much, Clive. It's really great to be here with everyone. Um, So good morning or evening, um, wherever you're beaming in from. It's certainly evening here in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, I'd like to introduce myself um, firstly in Aotearoa New Zealand Indigenous language te reo Māori. So tēnā koutou katoa um, e te whānau, ko tā mai nei i tēnei wai, mihi ana kia koutou i tēnei rā, uh, e ngā hau e whānau, mai hara mai ki tā tātou hui. Um, So before I start, I'd like to um, take the opportunity to acknowledge that it's a real privilege to be here with you on International Women's Day and celebrate both the amazing women on this panel tonight, but also those joining to view the session. And I just want to wish you a joyful International Women's Day as we reflect on how we can take action on equity across our workplaces, economies and communities. So Clive, you asked me what brings me here today. I'm now in a career which is fully immersed in diversity, equity and inclusion, a a wonderful um, place to be for me. 
um, two real main drivers or points for me. I have, a, I have a deeply held belief that the dynamic, the most dynamic and successful professions and workplaces of the future will be those that embrace, attract, include and empower diverse talent. They'll be more innovative, productive, sustainable and profitable than those who continue with systems, processes and cultures that have served them well up till now, but won't serve them well into the future. I just think this is a huge opportunity for the accounting profession now to take bold action to disrupt some of the systems um, that are driving the inequitable outcomes for women described in the research today. The second is a deeply held belief about the concept of equity and the fact that in order for us to begin this conversation, we have to agree and accept that not everyone is starting on the same starting line and not everyone is having the same lived experience. They're not having the same access to opportunities or outcomes. My story is about being a white, cisgendered, heterosexual, able-bodied male. I hold privilege against every diversity dimension. I've never experienced any discrimination or bias in any situation inside or outside the workplace. The systems that I operate, that I've operated within, within my career are set up for me to succeed and have been the foundation of my success. I acknowledge that my lived experience just isn't the same as a woman's. I'm much less likely, for instance, to be spoken over to in a meeting. I will never experience sexual harassment. When I negotiate my salary, I'm perceived to be smart, commercial and ambitious. Um, sometimes my female colleagues are perceived to be arrogant, greedy and troublemakers. So with that in mind, I'm delighted that the research presented today is putting to bed the narrative that it's a woman's ambition that is holding them back from thriving through mid-career into senior leadership, but it is the system bias, workplace cultures and careers that are designed and valued which haven't historically supported women to succeed. I think the good news here is, is the accounting profession has a once in a generation opportunity to transform itself from what's perceived to be a, tra a traditional long hours, high stress, high burnout career option which values people with, without other life responsibilities into a flexible and agile inclusive and dynamic choice for our next generation where women and men can thrive into positions of influence. Um, finally, Clive, we need to stop trying to fix the women and we need to fix the system. I'll come back to you now. My apologies, beginner's mistake. <laughs> I've even got a sign here that says unmute, but I didn't read it. <laughs> My apologies. Thanks, Joe. Um, so turning to now to Zimkita. Zimkita joins us from South Africa. Zimkita, looking at your job life, it's clear that you were a very successful woman, but I, I don't believe your journey was easy in any manner or form. So perhaps you could uh, share it with us. If, if, if. Thank you so much, Clive. Uh, again, good morning. I'm in South Africa, it's morning. So good morning to everybody. And yes, Clive, uh, uh, you're quite right. It has not been a straightforward journey, but I am, I'm, I'm quite a successful woman. Uh, it's one of the things that I own because I worked so hard for it, right? So, <clears throat> I'm a divorced single parenting mom. And as, as part of the backlash for the divorce, I actually um, I am sole providing to my daughter who is now 17 years old. So I, I just want to take people to the beginning of where this whole thing started. I, I mean, the past 15 years is where I'm gonna focus. In 2008, I found myself in a dilemma. So I got married in 2004 um, after dating the same person for seven years. Uh, I was supposed to be happy according to society standards half of a successful couple and everything was going well, right? And I give credit to my ex-husband, whoever he is, <laughs> for the foundation of my success as a CA. He is a huge part of my success as a CA, right? Uh, he believed in empowered women. He loved the idea of um, women making their own money and creating their own wealth. So what went wrong? Uh, from the start, he struggled to commit to the parenting journey. 
And for me, I picked this up immediately. He believed like what he had seen when he was growing up, he didn't have to be as committed to parenting uh, like, like I was. And the solution that was given to him was that I had to exit the work environment. Now, anyone who knows me, my career, my journey as a CA is self-funded for 10 years of part-time studying and, and, and full-time working. So I had invested heavily in my career as a black woman in South Africa with our past and all those hurdles to get to where I was and someone to tell me that all of that had been in vain, right? So um, I actually fought back and I said, because everyone around, around uh, me, Clive, was agreeing with him. So I had now become a society's pariah, is that the right word? And 15 years later, I'm more successful, right? And I'm more kind of like visible um, in my profession than I ever could have been. And so when I actually looked at the results, uh, for, for me, I always say to young people, because I talk to a lot of young women, and, and I say, parenting is not the issue. The issue is society weaponizing parenting to sabotage women's careers and chances of and, and their chances of creating tangible financial success. And that is a systemic issue. Th that women are asked to actually measure their value on intangible things, mother's touch, woman's love, labor of love. And that has been the scam that has been going on for a long, long time. And I call it a scam because this has been used to drive women away from the workplace. Because most of the time, you're taking on all of this work in the home, you get into the office, you can't uh, compete at the same level as, as someone who doesn't have the same kind of parental labor, because it is what, that, that is what it is, is labor. And therefore, you, you actually then are trying so hard all the time and you're in the back foot all the time, trying to, 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 uh, to catch up with everybody else. And then what happens is then the narrative that women cannot cope with positions of power and with positions, executive leadership positions, it, it stays. And then women are actually being uh, driven out of the workplace. And then uh, Clive, I want to actually be clear. I'm talking here about heterosexual relationships, not, I mean, I don't think we have enough evidence uh, for same parent uh, homes. So what I'm going to do now is to share, uh, Clive, one solution for me that has helped me for 15 years. Because I always say that this is a systemic issue. So that's why I always tell people, I'm not even bitter at my ex-husband. I'm bitter at the system, right? Because it's a systemic issue and it needs systemic solutions. And one of the things that I'm going to share with you is a story I actually, um, a, a life experience from year 2000. I was in the beginning of my trainee contract, right? And as a Black South African woman, South African, with our history and my education, I had identified that I needed presentation skills to talk to clients because we were dealing with a lot of clients. And then I actually went and I, I, I got a quote for this presentation skills course. I took it to HR and to some of the partners and then everybody said, it's not our policy. It is not our policy for us to actually fund this kind of study. I was already funding my own study, so I could not find this one. And um, I went to my mentor and, and, and was with, with they, we call them counselors uh, um, in our firm. And I explained to him what was going on. I said, I don't understand when people say it's not our policy. 99% of the people here are able to present and speak English in their, in their first language, right? So for me, it has been my experience that policies can most of the time struggle to actually address individual needs. And that is what motherhood is about. It's about we need policies that can be flexed to adjust individual needs. And this uh, advice that I got is one of the best things that has actually uh, saved me for the past 15, uh, 23 years, actually. So he said to me, Zimkita, you cannot rely 100% uh, on a system that was designed to exclude you. If you can't present, right? If you, if you fail as, 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 as a trainee, then you feed into the narrative that you were not supposed to be here anyway. Anytime uh, you actually need to actually em empower yourself and, 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 and uh, have identified issues in the system that are barriers, the first thing you need to understand, you must invest in your own career. You must invest in your own talents. Because when you bring money into the table, 
then people will start listening. So he advised me to save my own uh, 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 part of the, of, 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 the of, of, of the course. And then I went back to HR and I said, I've got 2000 rands now, right? I want to tell you that no matter what you do, I'm still gonna take this course because I have identified that I need the presentation skills because that's, that, that's what is gonna be good for me in my career. And also I am willing to take unpaid leave to actually go to this course because it's important to me, because it's good for my reputation, it's good for my brand to be able to present to clients with confidence. I tell you, Clive, within two days, they were gonna fund, they came back to me, they were gonna fund the full 4,500. Not only that, they were gonna give me time because he said that Zimkita corporates understand power. And if you have money to actually get yourself some of the choices you need to make, because the issue is, Clive, people are saying women are exiting. That is not a good thing. But they, we don't see the other side of it, that if you stay on and you can't compete in that environment, the reputational brand uh, uh, risk is so much. And it's not only affecting Zimkita as a woman, it actually affects all Black women. All women, they cannot handle being in, in positions of power. And therefore, if you are parenting and you are tired and the best way is to actually try and exit a little bit, take a breather, re-strategize. I have actually been more successful in the periods where I've taken the career break than when I'm actually at work, I've become more productive. In 2020, I took 10 months a, a, a career break and I self-funded it because my daughter was dealing with chronic pain, a, a, with a chronic pain issue. And that year has been the most successful year. I wouldn't be on this web, uh, webcast today if it was in for 2020, because I had time to sit and say, what is it that I want to achieve? What value am I gonna add back to the profession when I come back, right? Because I have to be able to articulate what value I bring to people. And for me, that is very important for me when to understand that when you take a career break, it is not necessarily a loss. You, you, you actually get time to rebrand, to rebuild, your, to acquire the talent and the skills that you need to actually help you live to the next uh, level. So Clive, I mean, I, I talk a lot, so I keep on checking my notes so that I don't run out of time. But um, so the last thing as Clive is, parenting is the biggest leadership role that we can take. And I think for me, that's a message I would like to leave with anyone who is um, a, 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 the, the, an employer. Parenting is a biggest leadership role that anyone can take. I have not, I mean, if I wasn't a parent, I would not be where I am. I actually would have been successful for sure. But for me, parenting actually made me conscious of humanity and the, 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 the things that they need to actually thrive. So I always tell young people that one of the things that parenting has done for me as a mother, which is something that mothers, I think it comes naturally, is my ability to transform myself and meet the young people at their struggles and lead them and make sure that they thrive. And that for me is because I'm a parent, I'm a parent of a child with a chronic illness and she's amazing. So <laughs> when I actually lead, I know that I, I can actually listen to a young person and actually understand what are your struggles, what are your strengths? Because we grow through our strengths, not our weaknesses, right? And we can work around our weaknesses. I only learned that as a parent and that's made me a much better leader. It made me a much more better, um, a, a successful CA and a competent and confident CA. If I have to give uh, um, solutions, Ainsley, I was actually gonna say as well, one of the things that I want us to teach young women is to save upfront. From the beginning of their careers, they must make saving. They, I, 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 can't, I can't stress this enough because at some point you have to bring money to the table. You have to say, if I don't get what I need and the, my reputation is at risk, because that's what the key thing here is a reputational risk. And if you mess up, your confidence will, is never gonna uh, recover, right? Most of the time, because you're gonna mess up big if you're tired and all of those things. And then your self-worth, you're gonna question your own self-worth. Sometimes you have to take decisions, like Ensley said, to say, I'm gonna open my own business. And when you make those decisions, like me, saying I'm gonna opt out just for a year and take care of my child, you better have money in the bank account to actually support your own dreams. Thanks, Clive. 
Thank you, Sankita. That was fascinating. Um, and and thank you in particular for being so open and sharing all of your experiences. I certainly think you brought a lot more to the table than just money. So uh, well done. And uh, I also think, you know, you highlighted one of the survey results around the importance of having leaders around you or as you, you know, a counselor who understands and is supportive. That is so, that is so key to everyone's success, frankly. Good. So moving along, um, we've now got another poll question to make sure everybody's paying attention. Which of the following would have the biggest impact to help women progress in the workplace? Again, you've got four choices, equal paternity leave, flexible working, reporting to a supportive manager, and family-friendly culture. So I can't actually see. I can now. So flexible working is uh, leapt out in front. Let's just see if it settles there. Let's pull it. Good. Well, that seems fairly conclusive that flexible working is out there with all the, with some 58% followed by reporting to a supportive manager, which we, we just touched on actually. Good. Well, thanks everyone for participating in that. I think, you know, these results make for interesting reading. And I'd now like to welcome Sinead Donovan, who is the chairperson of Grant Thornton and incoming Grant Thornton Ireland and incoming president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Ireland. Sinead, as a working mother yourself, what are your views on the results of the poll? Yeah, thanks, Clive. And, and look, I'm I'm very interested to see the flexible working has come has come first. I um to me the, the second one was what came out in the poll, the supportive manager. And, and to me, the supportive managers are the glue. They are the catalyst. They are the drivers to ensure that policies and support are implemented. But it's, it, it, it's, a, whole, it's a whole raft of things that, that go to support women. So look, good morning, everyone, or good, good, good evening, or wh wherever you may be. Um, it's lovely to be talking to the global family of accountants. Let me start with some facts here from Ireland. Uh, which really support the need for this type of conversation. We carried out some research, we being the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Ireland, carried out some research in July 2021 and noted the following. Two in five females claim their gender has impacted negatively on their career, compared to three in four males who claim their gender had no impact. And then the other fact in Ireland was that close to half of all females claim to have personally experienced discrimination during their career in accountancy versus just over one in five males. So look, these findings linked with the findings in this CA worldwide um, research um, on the mid-career females means that undoubtedly there are issues in the profession for females and most profoundly at the crunch time of their mid-career. I get it because I've lived it. I've come out the other side, but I do bear some scars and I don't want anyone else to go through that experience. Those personal experiences have framed my thoughts on the issues and more importantly, what can be done to address the challenges. So I'd like you to have two Northern stars as you listen to me speak. The first, the first star is we need to create an environment where females can bring their full self to work. And the second Northern star is ensure that management have the appetite, the training and the time to be supportive innovative and flexible in how they manage and navigate mid-career females in their team. The first theme of being able to bring your full self to work really comes from a personal experience of, of, of mine, not being permitted to do so at times in my career journey. Just as my career was taken off as a new partner, I collided with the personal challenges of having a family, of having to navigate being time poor, and most importantly, of dealing with changing views around me 
as peers decided that I had changed with the change in my personal self. And what do I mean by that? Well, when I announced I was pregnant, I saw an overt shift as my peers, who were generally male at that time, assumed I would lose my passion, assumed I would lose my hunger, and assumed I would lose my ambition. None of that was true. So in an effort to prove this, I overcompensated and I became more hungry. I became more driven. Dare I say it, I became more aggressive and by definition, more stressed and deeply unhappy. I wasn't permitted to bring my full self to work. The full self, which was that female who was dealing with conflicting pressures on their time, their emotions and their responsibilities and who was hugely struggling but was wearing a mask of toughness. So now as a leader, I tried to learn from my mistakes, from my error in not being a true role model to other females. And I am very vocal about the challenges that females feel at this time of their lives in the hope that females in my team, in my firm, in my profession will feel safe and empowered to verbalize if they are feeling those pressures. Secondly, when females do acknowledge this and speak up, I want to ensure that managers know what to do and how to react. This takes time. It is not a one size fits all. And time is quite often exactly what leaders and managers don't have. So it is critical that we give leaders the time and the tools to navigate what will only be a temporary flex or a temporary provision of support to their teams. Perhaps it may be the flexible time of working that came out in the poll. It may be the ability to work from home. It may be increased team resources to cover some tasks, or it may be counseling to emotionally support the female. But whatever it is, it will be temporary and it will ensure that that female stays in the profession and stays in a position to platform themselves to the next level. So my message today is to three cohorts. One, to the females themselves, two, to the leaders in the audience, and three, to us, the profession. To the females, be brave and bring your concerns to work. Seek out where you can to get support. And if that is not in your workplace, then that role must fall to us as profession owners. To leaders in companies, please ensure you design policies to support mid-career females, but most importantly, live those policies. Train your management to know how to flex with those who need support. Policies and procedures only go so far and will not be effective without a supportive manager. And finally to us, the profession owners, we need to do exactly what we are doing here. Ensure the issue is talked about, guide the profession as to how to navigate it and to ultimately be there for our own members if they feel they cannot get the support from their closest stakeholders. Thanks, Clive, and thanks to this webinar. Thanks, Sinead. Some very interesting points. Thank you for sharing. Now uh, we're going, we've got a little over 10 minutes left. We're going to move to a panel discussion. Uh, we've been monitoring some of the questions coming in, and I'm going to pose and direct them to our panel members. So firstly, um, Zimkita, if I could go to you. How does one deal with imposter syndrome that stands in the way of women achieving their best ambitions? Uh, uh, Clive, I'm going to give the same answer as, as, as uh, my solution. We need to invest. I mean, um, when I talk to, to young people around the imposter syndrome, is I always say to them, it's important for you to make sure that you've invested in your own uh, uh, talents. You have to find out what is it that is making you I feel like you don't belong because that's that's what that's what the issue is. We feel like we don't belong in those spaces. Is it a matter of uh, you can't speak uh, in meetings? If that's the case, you actually spend time over the weekends and practice. You practice speaking. You listen to podcasts when you go to work. You do practical things that uh, that so, so that you actually are ready and you invest. You take control of your own career and invest in your career. And, and the people who actually have, uh, have come to me and asked me these questions around imposter syndrome, they come back to me and say, I didn't know that actually everything was in my hands 
So if your issue is an IFRS statement you don't understand, you go on Google and you Google the statement and you listen to the podcast when you go to work. And when you come back from work, you listen to the podcast. What are the key issues? And then you practice presenting that to the client. You practice, practice, and practice. Everything we need for our success is in our hands. I am proof of that, right? Everything you need in order to succeed is available to you. You have to go and get it. And that is what I always say. Because the moment you rely on other people, then you're giving them power over you. The first thing you must always do, invest in your success. That is the best investment you can ever make. Thanks, Anita. I was actually just recalling a personal experience of mine. I remember going to a women's business club event here in Zurich, where I, where I live. There was about 100 women, and I was the only male. And I, what impressed me the most was the number of women who approached me to make me feel comfortable in that environment. And frankly, I don't think in an all male environment, there's many men who would approach the single woman in that meeting to make her feel comfortable. So food for thought, it was a very positive experience for me. So looking at the questions again that are coming in, I'm gonna to go to Ainsley now. Um, Ainsley, how do we break the perception that women who succeed in the corporate space must give up their family life and the career, which in contrast, you know, men, men don't have this challenge. Men, men, men can do both. Mm, well, it's a good question, Clive. I mean, this sense of obligation that you can only have a career at the expense of your family life. Well, I think it's a myth, to be honest. Um, and, you know, to that, to that point about taking control of your own destiny, if you let it, if you work those, those ridiculous, ridiculous hours, um, if, if you, you don't put your own boundaries, boundaries around, around you, you, then yes, it will be at the expense of your family life for men or for women. Um, but, you know, it, it does seem to be a traditional stereotype of women being at home or men go out to work at the breadwinner, and that's, that's the stereotype we really need to smash and, and to, to get, get rid of. Um, the, and the effect of it's crippling because for, for women in particular, because it creates this kind of terrible scenario where you feel like you're choosing between guilt, between children and your careers, and it creates this intense kind of guilt. And there's this, I guess, stigma as well that women who do have successful careers are somehow cold or uncaring, which couldn't be further from the truth. And in my own personal lived experience and observations working with some incredible women who are also mothers. And the stereotypes in general, they're just unfair for everyone. They're unfair for men, unfair for women. Because if you look at the flip side, for example, it relies on a view that, you know, men are not able to parent or parent well, which is really a terrible myth as well. So it speaks exactly to that point that I was saying earlier about encouraging more men to feel more confident about being a hands-on parent. And when we have more men stepping confidently into their role as a caregiver, and then they do it in a way that's loud and proud at work, so other men can see it and they role model, then other particularly young junior men can see it's okay for them to do the same when they have children. And that will then break down those myths and those stereotypes that hold back women, but also um, men back from their families. And then finally, I'd say kind of as senior leaders, male and women, we should not hide our family commitment. So be open that you're going to a sports carnival. I always am, I'm very open with my team, the people around me, the people on my floor, very proudly say I'm going to a sports carnival or I'm going to watch prize day or um, I need to work from home because my child is sick that day. And I also try very hard not to normalise working hard. Um, I often quote, uh, I think it was President Eisenhower, who um, very strictly worked strict eight-hour days. Um, he was very uh, conscious of his time that he spent he, and he was very strong about the fact that as a human being, he needed to have as much time to do his exercise, to be with his family, and that giving a full eight hours a day where you're fully present to the, you know, to, to the US, to the country was sufficient. And of course, you know, there's always times where you have urgent matters and things like that. But I just, I try and remember that for myself as well, that, you know, eight hours a day is a significant amount of time to invest in your work. So don't normalize 12, 14 hour days. It's really just simply not necessary. Um, and of course, you know, also manage those cycles so that when you do have a time where you do have an urgent matter or you've got, you know, it's audit period, for example, where we all know that that is a, you know, a tough time, then also normalise the lulls. So take advantage of the lulls that you have um, in the cyclical nature of your work and be vocal about what you're doing with that time, i.e. that you're investing it with your family, 
that you're actually administering self-care, going for a massage, going for a run, going for a walk, being out in the sunshine, whatever it might be. Because I really do believe the more vocal you are about that, um, then, you know, the more a successful career will seem not to be at the detriment of having a great family life. Thanks, Clive. Thanks, thanks Ainsley. I'm conscious that we've got more questions than time, so I'm trying to work my way through this. Maybe a question for Sarah. I'm conscious that her internet might not hold up, in which case I'd ask Roseanne to step in. But Sarah, question came in, how do you ask for a pay rise when you know you're about to go off on maternity leave, even though you know you're underpay, underpaid compared to the market? That's almost an impossible question to answer, I think. Um, I mean, I'm not somebody who can give um, kind of coaching advice, but I think if I listen to what the research said and if I listen to the stories that were told to us, there were people that had conversations with their superiors about their responsibilities and their roles and what their level of um, remuneration would be coming back. Um, and there were ways in which they had those conversations where they were able to work towards increasing their remuneration in order to allow them to be able to drop their hours slightly. So I don't know how, you know, how do you approach that conversation? Maybe you talk about the responsibilities that you have. Maybe you talk about um, the commitment and what you've achieved and what you can bring to the career when you come back um, and how that will help to um give you a focus and stuff like that I mean I think it's just you know it, it's an individual conversation but what it boils down to is what came out top of the poll uh, or top of the study supported line managers you need a line manager who recognizes um your value recognizes your contribution and, and enables you to facilitate going on uh, maternity leave, going on parental leave, but still being able to think about your career and what that means for you and coming back. And it's your line manager who needs to be that champion for you. They need to recognize. And it's not like when we, I was disappointed. Well, I see, I suppose where flexible working came out as one of the biggest barriers. Yes, flexible working is key, but it takes the line manager to make sure that that flexible working is implemented and used and encouraged and um, put into action. So whilst those policies need to be there, it is always the line manager. You know, if you've got a line manager that understands and is supportive, you don't think twice about saying, sorry, excuse me, I've got to go and do this today. You know, I'll, I'll make it up later or I'll sort that out. And it's fine, but if you know you've got a line manager who doesn't understand, who doesn't have that recognition or who always puts somebody else ahead of you, being able to say something is complicated, difficult and potentially more stressful, puts that barrier and stops you asking for the support that you need. So, um, so I think it, it, it just comes down to educating and getting good line managers on board and having those conversations, being able to have difficult conversations is what a line manager should do. So training. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, three minutes. I'm going to try and squeeze in one more question before we, we wrap. Actually, I'm going to go to you, Joe. Um, we've touched a number of times on the importance of a sponsor, line manager. Um, what are your observations on male or female sponsors what's 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 working well what are some of the challenges um yeah it's a good question clive i'm i'm a big believer in um that women are over mentored and under sponsored i, I think mentoring um plays a plays a really important role in in supporting and building confidence um in early careers for women um but sponsorship is is action oriented i think mentoring can sometimes be quite passive um, in terms of providing advice and support. When we talk about sponsorship, we're talking about actively elevating women into leadership positions and having the onus on the sponsor to take accountability for that. And I think that's underdone. And I think more men should be, should be doing this. When we say there are men are overrepresented in positions of leadership across our economies, um, we should be asking more men to be sponsoring women with accountability to um, to elevate them into positions. It's I think it's too passive and too easy to say um, we're doing mentoring and I'm having a monthly catch up and I'm having a copy. Is that having an impact? Actually, let's get real. Let's get action oriented and let's be, get accountable around around sponsorship. That's what's going to really make a shift. Thanks very much, Joe. 
Well, unfortunately, we're in the last minute. Um, that's all we've got time for today. But don't, please don't forget to download a summary of the study's findings via, via the QR code on the screen or by heading to Chartered Accountants Worldwide website. Lastly, I want to say a huge thank you to all our speakers today. And thank you to our partners at Big Top Multimedia and A1 for bringing this event to life. See you the next time, everyone. Bye for now.